Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the last set of material for my senior. Okay? Now, I'm teaching today and I'm teaching on Wednesday. We're doing the old school. Everything is material taught in class. We will not be having the pre notes. So if you look at Google Classroom, there's only one last thing seniors have, and that's the test. That will be next Wednesday. Next Wednesday will be your test. Test is seven essays, 20 points a piece. Okay? Yes? Is that the last test of the year? No, not for you. Because you have one more week after that. I've got something to do with you. It'll be yours will be school simple. It'll be just for me. It's just for me. Okay. All right, now, a couple cool things we're going to do tomorrow as part of the lab, we're going to do uh, making silly putty. Now, the silly putty will be a, um, what's the one for? A uh, discovery process, okay? The, the way the, the main labs have you set up the silly putty is with a 20% borax solution. But I find that the 20% borax solution makes it like really brittle. It breaks apart really easily. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you discover what concentration works best. So measure out a certain amount of borax with regular water. Because the more water you have it, the more loose it is. So if you have too much water, it'll be like snotch. Okay? If you have too much of the borax, it becomes like a rock. So you want to find a proper mix inside of it. There's no lab write-up for either of the labs because these are just end of the year fun kind of labs. And I'll give you a little Ziploc bag to take the silly putty home on, um, to, on Tuesday. The lab, the silly putty will not last forever because it's made out of borax, made out of Elmer's glue. So the longer you keep it wet, the longer it'll last, but eventually it will dry out and it'll fall all apart. Uh, question? Well, is it actually kind of like slime? No, it's no, it's not. It, it actually is like silly putty. It stretches. In fact, the record for how loose one group got it, one group, one student group got it from that corner to that corner and halfway back. I'm going to be sad. I won't be here tomorrow, so can they switch it up and do it on Wednesday instead? <laughs> Please. Uh, Are we tied on again? Yeah, we're tied down on Wednesday. We're going to love on Wednesday. We can do both of on Wednesday because there's material tomorrow. And then I'll. We can do silly putty today. No, I can't. I can't. Come. And that's the other part. I need. That's all the glue I have. That's not enough. Okay? I put an email out. I put it in the Google Classroom. If you want a chance for bonus points, you give me this size. I'll give you two points bonus. You give me up to two. You're not. I'm not going to give you but like 55 bonus points. Better. Give me this point. I'll give you a point and a half. You give me a color pack. Okay. I'll tell you what. As, as long as everyone else will be here tomorrow, I except for Miss Levin. Listen, I, I'm the. Everyone else will be here on Wednesday, so I'm looking at it. I did buy the T-shirts for everybody, like I said I was going to, except for the three that told me they want to buy their own. Okay. So I have to soak those. It'd be soaked in a sodium carbonate solution in order to make break down some of the bonds in the t-shirt and make the dye attach more easily. So I will move it to Wednesday Thank and you. make everybody happy. All right. Yeah. But make sure you get the notes. Yeah, I will. Because it's this all notes. That's all we're doing here. Okay. So if you want any bonus points, make sure I get those tomorrow. Okay. All right, up to three. I won't give you more than six points bonus. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't, like, get you 55 bonus points. That would be sort of. Oh, All right, we're looking today at modern materials. Modern materials are defined as materials that were created in rich times that have no correlation to the natural world. world. So these are things that are formed that are synthetics. They're man-made structures. We're going to look at two or three today, and we're going to look at three on tomorrow. And then the test on, so we'll do the lab on Wednesday. Friday, I won't see you. Monday, I won't see you. Tuesday, I'll do a review with you. Test will be on Wednesday. Does that sound fair? Yeah. And then Friday, the last Friday, we'll clean the lab doors out. Make sense? 
All righty, so we're looking at liquid crystals first. The first structure we'll look at is liquid crystals. Liquid crystals are defined as molecules arranged in an organized way to produce a desired effect, okay? Molecules arranged in an organized way to produce a desired effect. Now, you don't usually hear liquid crystals themselves. They're more commonly referred to by three letters. Anyone know what three letters liquid crystals usually are associated with? I can guarantee they're in your home. At least one or two of them, maybe more than that. In my house, I think I have one, two, three, four, I think I have five. Three letters. L, C, D. LCD, liquid crystal displays. The LCD. I thought it was LSD. No. <laughs> A little bit different. Okay, so an L LCD is an example of a liquid crystal. Now, the first, we take our crystals and put them in a structure. They're an unorganized mess, okay? They're just floating around. This actually was discovered by accident. Um, a scientist had these crystals in solution and they got electrified. When they get electrified, they arrange themselves in a straight up and down fashion. You're going to want to draw that picture in your notebook. Okay. Now, this type of structure, straight up and down, is referred to as nomadic liquid crystal. Straight up and down, it's called nomadic liquid crystal. Has anybody ever heard of something called security glass? Have you heard of security glass before? You have, you have an office, and the office has a glass window so people can see out. But they want to have a private meeting. They click the button, electrifying the plate glass, all the liquid crystals inside of it align themselves, and it goes gray. That's what security glass is. That was the first discovered arrangement for liquid crystals. That was like discovered in the 1950s, 1960s, okay? Then about the 70s and 80s, are we all good here? Give me one more time. That's the only thing I hate about teaching this way because it's, I want to roll and I can't. 70s and 80s, we found that if we change their axis slightly, we can generate different colors. So like, like street lights, red, blue, green, a lot of those have gone to I arrange them in a specific angle, we'll get a specific color. At a specific angle, we call that somatic liquid crystals. Again, I draw that picture in your notes if I were you. Okay? So these will generate different specific colors, but only one color at a time, okay? one color at a time. So if I want a blue light, if I want a red light, I will put them up at specific angles based on the polarity of the axis, shifting the light through it, causing refraction, we get the process of somatic liquid crystals. Okay, does that make sense? We all good? All right, the last type of liquid crystal is where we layer them, okay? We can have multiple axes, electrical field, which cause them to create specific pixels of color. We call this colostoric liquid crystal phase. Colostoric liquid crystal phase. And this is your monitors at home with your flat screen TVs, okay? That's how you get all those different bright colors because they can literally pinpoint the color angle and be able to affect those liquid crystals in such a way that we get the vibrant colors that we see in modern TVs. Does that make sense? So make sure you know the difference between the three different types of uh, liquid crystals, how they're formed up and what they accomplish. Does that make sense? 
give you three seconds here. Yeah. How they arrange? Okay. Yeah, like the somatic history up and down, the mat exit, get different angles, and then the cold store during layers, get as multi colors. Does that make sense? All right, awesome. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is called biomaterials. Okay. Biomaterials are defined as. Okay, synthetic materials used in living organisms. Putting something synthetic inside of somebody is a biomaterial. Okay. Um, this summer, I just got told that I had an awesome opportunity to do research at Barron. So I'll be doing six weeks at Barron up there doing research up there. Um, when I went up there before, they were telling us about um, one of their projects has to do with an artificial heart. Now, this is quite a few years ago. You guys ever hear of Barney Clark? Barney Clark's the first man to have an artificial heart. When he had the artificial heart, he was literally bedridden until the day he died. He extended his life for about eight months. He had to be bedridden because the pumps needed to run the heart were about the size, you know those carts we have for the old um, laptops, carts? That was the size of the cart that had to be dragged around wherever you went in order to run the system. Well, when I went to Bear last time, they were telling us about this Chinese student who was leading one of their tours at the university. She had a little bag in front of her. She had an artificial heart, and the entire pump system were inside the vein bag, so she was able to move around. Now, artificial hearts are not a, a like lifetime. They're only used long enough to get you a donor heart. They are extremely expensive. But the things we have to understand in order to make sure that they work, okay? One of the requirements for biomaterial, biocompatibility. Does anybody have <coughs> any concept what biomaterial compatibility would be? What would be biocompatibility? Alex, what do you think biocompatibility is? Well, in any way at all, yes. Tendency material to accept into the body. We're trying to stop something called rejection. Okay? When you take an artificial heart, okay, is it your heart? No. And when anything foreign comes into the body, what is the body's tendency to... Um, to a dating process. Does anyone know? How? How does it get rid of it? We have a specific part of the body we use to attack foreign substances. Starts with an A. And then antibodies. Antibodies, yes. Okay, so like if you have, if, I don't know if you saw, I had a little, I had a, actually a thorn that was in my hand. When it first came in, it puffed up to about that big. And then once the blood settled out of it, I had a big redness all around here, as a, like basically like a bruise. But that was the reaction of the body attacking a foreign substance. What it usually will do is it will try, the antibodies attack the substance, they coat them so that it doesn't react with the system, and they try to process it out. That's why like if you get a splinting hand, it'll fester until it comes out all by itself. And that's the process. Well, we don't want that. So we try to figure out a way to fool the body into accepting this material. Now, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. One is through medication. What we call um, immunity suppressing drugs. Now, the only problem with using immunity suppressing drugs is do you need your immunity? So if you suppress it too much, what can happen? You can get a cold and die, okay? So you need to have a trade-off for that. What they're also now doing is using 
stem cells. Okay, stem cells are the natural product found in the body. So what they'll do if they want to put an artificial heart in is they'll take your stem cells and build a artificial structure like a heart valve through genetic structure. And then they grow tissue on top of that so that when it's injected and put into the body, the body sees it as being part of who you are because it has your DNA in it. Does that make sense? All right, so that's the first one, biocompatibility. Second thing we gotta remember, it's a physical requirement. What do you think we mean by physical requirements? Maria, what do you think we mean by physical requirements? Well, not talking about you, I'm talking about the material itself. Clean and everything, and has to have a tendency to last. Okay. Um, one of the, we used to have a principal here uh, way back when I first started. His name was Bob Russick. Okay. Mr. Russick loved to ski, but unfortunately, because of years of athletic activity, he'd blown out both his knees. Right. So he had to have knee replacements. Now, when they first started doing knee replacements back in the '90s. They were made out of steel. Is steel natural material? No. So after about two or three years, you have to go in and get them replaced and constantly do that process. Today, does anyone know what we use for um, metals for like if you have a plate in your head or knee replacement? Does anyone know what? Is it titanium? Yeah, it is titanium. Okay, we use titanium because titanium is an extremely non-reactive metal. So we like triple the life. Now, do they still have to be replaced? Yes. And we also use various kinds of silicon inside of there to act like your cartilage. Okay. Uh, one of the guys I used to go to prison with for the Gideons. <laughs> going to prison. Yeah. Um, he had both his knees replaced. So whenever he would go into an airport, he would have always wear shorts. So that way, when he ran to the gun detector, and the alarm went off, he say, uh, see the surgery? That's where they went. They're inside my legs. All right, so the tendency to last using any of some sense will be uh, either strong material or durable. Stuff like silicon, things that can stretch and not break. Does that make sense? All right, third requirement of biomaterial third requirement of biomaterial is a chemical requirement. Greg, what do you think we mean by chemical requirement? Um, not required to work chemically, but not to react chemically. Can it still not to have an adverse chemical reaction? When they first started using artificial processes, they used a lot of plastics. Are plastics good for the body? No, no plastics are made out of polymers. Polymers are long chain carbon stuff you will look at here in a second. But what happened is the body would really, it would start producing sulfates inside the bloodstream. Those are toxic. Those would kill people. They make sure that they're they won't react to the body in such a way to cause a chemical reaction that will hurt you. Does that make sense? All right, now, examples of biomaterials, okay? The first is cardiovascular work. So these would be heart valves or hearts themselves. We want to get really out there, okay? It would also have to do with veins. If you had a major injury, such that like a good section of your arm was removed, they can't necessarily replace those. Now, in the past, what they used to do is they take a cadaver, they take a dead person, they would cut the veins and they'd surgically try to reconnect the veins in your arm. But again, are those your veins? No. So they would take artificial tissue 
and try to regenerate structure along those lines. Okay, second thing we can use is artificial tissue as in skin grafts. If you're burned or any way damaged, you need to replace the skin. Does anyone know the primary place they take skin if it's not also damaged to graft from your own body? A little bit higher. Your butt, okay? They take the graft. So people that have skin grafts, a lot of them they have their foot on the face, okay? But because skin is skin, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of tissue back here. And usually because this area is protected, it's less likely to be burned or damaged. Does that make sense? Now, unfortunately, if a person is really badly burned, there may not be any place to get a graft from. So they have to actually generate artificial tissue to try to graft on the person, okay? Does that make sense? All right, and the last, the last is joint repair. So hips, knees. Um, one of the women that lives with my in-laws, um, she was working in the kitchen, helping get center later, and there's a mentally challenged adult that works. He bumped into her, pushed her over, broke her hip. And it, literally the hip was sheared off. So they had to do a hip replacement, actually put a new joint in, in order to cause it. It was made out of titanium, got silicon on the outside of it, things on those lines. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, now, the last concept that we're gonna look at today, and what we're gonna do in the lab here on Wednesday now, since Ms. Lehman so asked me to be nice, is polymers. Polymers are defined as long chain organic structures with a repeating structure. <coughs> long chain organic structures with repeating sequences. Now, one thing I didn't get to this year, because the whole COVID thing, I will touch a little bit with my juniors where I hear that last week, is organic. Does anyone know what organic is? What is organic? The entire field of chemistry called organic chemistry. And when I hear about it, I begin to have highs and begin to feel sick to my stomach, okay? I have three college transcript Cs. All the rest were A's, okay? Bowling, I never bowled before in my life. I went into this class, told it to an easy class. The professor in charge decided not to make it an easy class. You had to get 100 to 150 average by the end of the semester. I started at 32. Yes. So the only thing that saved me in that class was tests. And there were some people who actually failed the bowling test. I don't know how, but they did. So I got to see. Organic one and organic two. Now, part of the reason why I don't like organic is I had Dr. Fast Eddie Hoganson. Dr. Hoganson was notorious for being the fastest professor in the university. We, we covered 36 chapters in 30 weeks. Thanksgiving, we had a lab the day before Thanksgiving. Usually when you have a big holiday, the president go, hey, have a good one, go home, relax. Not Dr. Hogan said, oh no. We started four labs that night. I was there until 10.30 at night. That night, my mother and father got there and picked me up at 8.30. It is to say my mom was not a happy camper as we're heading back at like 11 o'clock at night. And the class started with 36 kids. We finished with six, okay? One A, one B, two C's, a D and an F. Second semester, I had a 56% C. And I was grateful, okay? I didn't learn organic the following year when I was the organic, the university's chem tutor, and I taught organic to the kids who were fully lost. And that's when I actually began to understand I had throw up chemistry. Blah! Hopefully hit something as you go. Organic chemistry, organic is carbon-based structures. Okay? And every polymer is made out of what's called a monomer. 
Polymers are made out of monomers. Poly means many, mono means one, right? A monomer is the repeating sequence in a poem. Whatever repeats itself over and over and over again, that's a monomer. Okay? Now we're going to have a couple different types of polymers here. Okay? Okay, the first we're looking at is a concept called plastics. Okay, plastics are usually what we refer to as thermoplastics or thermosetting plastics. Okay, they're organic structures, usually made out of carbon, oil based structures. Okay, and the process that we use to generate them is called. An extrusion. Okay. You guys know where C and J is? They're a plastic thermosetting operation. Okay. What they do is they take a box full of these little, little tiny beads and they dump them in a hopper and it heats up inside of there so it melts it and then it's forced through pressure to form like. Let's see if I can make it so like this was plastic that rubber material we're starting. That we built an extrusion. Now the difference between thermo thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics. A thermoplastic is material that can be shaped and reshaped. Okay, we heat it up, we melt it down. As it cools, it sets back up and we form a form. Then, if I use it for so long. I can heat it up again, melt it down, reform it. What, what do we call that process? Recycling. Thermosetting plastics are recyclable. Forever? Now there is a finite number of recycles because begin as you heat up, you also break down the structure slightly. So I believe two or three is the maximum number. If you've ever seen where they sort of get more gray in color, that's because they've been recycled more often. Does that make sense? Now the difference between thermo, thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics, these material that is set through a chemical process. So instead of just heating it up, you actually have to add different chemicals to make the bonds break apart and reform. And the disadvantage, the, the advantage of this is they're much more durable Okay, um, think about your plastic water bottle. Is that a very strong plastic? I mean, it, it, it just doesn't have a lot of durability to it. Thermo, thermosetting plastics are, have a strength to them. But because of that strength, they're often non recyclable. That's a definite disadvantage. Does that? All right, now, I got into myself. There are three different ways that we can form polymerization. The first is called additive polymerization. Additive polymerization is a result of breaking of the double bond. <coughs> the summers that I worked I worked at a chemical lab for three summers. One summer I worked at a MFG in Asheville, Ohio, molded fiberglass. And the last two summers I worked at Occidental Chemical. Okay. At Occidental Chemical, we formed what was called PVC. Does anyone know what PVC stands for? Think about it. Remember what are, mon what are monomers? Single monomers form polymers. So P stands for poly, poly, vinyl, chloride. Okay. Now vinyl chloride looks like this. Yeah. So we have two chlorine mo molecules 
in transposition across from each other across a double bond. Okay, what you do in order to convert vinyl chloride into polyvinyl chloride is you split that double bond. The resulting structure puts those chlorines on opposite ends of the structure, okay? Now you also have them on the same side, we call it cis position, and it gives a different quality, right? If I make these very, very, very short and condensed, I get a strong structure. You know like PVC pipes, how strong those are? But if I make that very, 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 very long, I can get a very, like you ever seen uh, the Black Widow for PVC jumpsuit? So you have the same material, but because it's longer, it's got more elasticity. Does that make sense? Now the problem with this reaction, this is a little exothermic. Um, when I was working in industry and we were testing the uh, quality efficiency of the PVC, I would have to work in a cube, uh, hood like this. And the hood would have what's called a blast shield. Last year, we come down to about here. It was made of a very thick polymer plastic that you can see here. Now, the reason why I came down to here is so I had a room to put my hands underneath it. I would add a very, very small amount of the chemicals that cause that breakdown of that bond and split to cause the polymer. And the reaction began to get a little hot. And I would keep it in ice in order to reduce the reaction. And then I, once it cooled down enough, I add a little bit more. If I was not smart and I put a lot in, what would happen is it would detonate. It would literally explode. Now, what was the purpose of the blast shield? It keep me, yeah, keep me alive, not kill me. When it exploded, it wouldn't like rip me to shreds. But where are my hands? Yeah, my hands are under the inside of the hood. So I knew working with it, if I went too fast, I could lose both of them. Okay, that was a possibility. No, that did not happen. I'm just going to say, we're good. No, no. The district is very, very conscientious about me. I used to have sodium, a foot there, right? Yeah. The material cross bar up there, they took that away. Anything that was like really, really fun. I used to have thermite in here. Do you know what thermite is? You put thermite, it's a combination of magnesium and aluminum metal fibers. You put that on top of a metal, like an engine block. You light it on fire and literally cut a hole right through your engine. It's that exothermic, it's that reactive. Thermite, bye bye. Anything I had that was extremely fun. I'm lucky to keep silver nitrogen sometimes. You know, I mean, I had to argue with the past administrators in order to keep anything that's somewhat fun. Does that process make sense? Any questions? All right, second type of polymerization is called the condensation polymerization reaction. Condensation polymerization reaction. All right, in a polymerization, we're removing water from a molecule, okay? So an example would be like we call esterification. Making of an ester. Esters are like your fragrances. They're also your butters, okay, your fats, okay? What we do for an ester We take a structure with a hydroxide. That's referred to as an alcohol. And we react it with that's a hydroxide and a double bond of oxygen, what's called a carboxyl. Okay? This hydroxide is going to combine up with that hydrogen to form. Water. And of course, this is what we call an R structure. There's a chain out here of some type. And there's an R structure over here, a chain of some type on that end. So what we end up with then is a carbon chain with an oxygen and a carboxyl between them. Does that make sense? So condensation reaction is a second type of polymerization. Now there's not just a certification, there's a lot of different 
and esters are, are in a very, very, like, they're polymer, but they're very short polymers. You can make very, very long polymers. But certainly like benzene rings, things along those lines, a lot of steroids, does that make sense? The last type, the one that we're going to do the lab on Wednesday now, since I'm such a nice guy, all right, is cross-linking polymerization. Now I mentioned these two terms before, I mentioned cis and trans, okay? Cis means what's on, which side it's on. Cis means it's on the same side, structures on the same side. And trans has to do it on the opposite side. Okay, now once we do that, we generate what's called an intermolecular bonding force, okay? We use some molecule, some molecule between the structure to provide the bonding structure, okay? Some molecule between the molecules to provide the bonding structure. So the lab that you're gonna do on Wednesday now, okay? Oh, one thing I will tell you, um, I don't have them. If you have any like plastic gloves, rubber gloves, you might want to breathe them because if we're doing silly putty, your hands can turn various different colors. Tie dyeing, you're definitely gonna turn very different colors. One time I did tie dyeing the day of prom and I didn't think about it. The girls freaked out on me. I said, I had, I said well, there's two choices. You can either cover your hands in bleach or wear gloves. Sorry, they weren't very happy for some reason. All right, so let me explain the process that you're going to do here in lab tomorrow, Wednesday. Okay, here is our liquid glue. Now there's often various different structures on there, but for right now, we're just gonna make it a simple organic change, single bonds, carbon and hydrogen. All right, we're gonna use borax. Borax is boronate. Okay, boronate has three oxygens attached. Now, what's the charge of these hydrogen ions? Positive or negative? How many, how many protons does hydrogen have? One, how many electrons does it have? One and it's locked away to that bond. So literally all of these are bare butt naked protons hang out in the wind. This entire side is positive. What's the charge of oxygen? Well, oxygen has unbonded electrons around it. So this end is negative. So having the opposite charge across it causes the attraction. <laughs> now, the more boronate you have inside of there, the stronger those connections are, the stiffer it gets. The more boronate and water molecules you have inside of there, the water can slide inside of those bonds, the looser it becomes. Does that make sense? So that's how an intermolecular bond works. We literally have something inside of there to cross link and hold them in place. Any questions with that? Yes, sir. Um, it's a different structure other than borate, borat, borate. It's an uh, organic structure. I'm not sure what inside there is to hold the molecule. The molecule has different structures so that it doesn't allow water to do things. Does that make sense? It was actually discovered by accident. When they were doing the silk putty, this guy was working on a material to act as a lubricant, trying to find a solid lubricant to work in the car. And he discovered silk putty, not all the things, and he the guy that was his boss was mad at him. So he said, just take that home with you. And then he found that it bounced and it stretched and it picked up images and he sold it, made a million dollars. All right, any questions? Does these things make sense? With that, we are done, that's it for today. All right.